Well, it's a pleasure for me to present today. Uh, this session is uh, merely interactive. So if you wanna talk, please raise your hands or just talk, interrupt, feel free. We are not in a grad school lecture where you listen and I talk. So this is a peer review between colleagues. All right, so who do we have in the audience? I don't, I, I see we have 36, 37 participants. Well, probably will take too long to, to introduce each other, but I'm gonna go and continue with the, with the presentation. So my proposition for this topic, uh, I had to change it a little bit because I know some centers are not capable to do uh, 3D or 4D IMRT or just conventional uh, radiotherapy. So we're gonna talk a little bit about positioning devices and immobilization methods. My presentation, even though I work for Electa, my presentation is merely educational and I will be presenting pictures from different vendors. So we're gonna talk a little bit about table coordinates, laser distance indicators, uh, positioning options, immobilization methods, mostly immobilization methods in this session and treatment verification method. So <clears throat> why do we accurate patient, why do we need accurate patient localization? Why do we care where the patient is positioned? So one is to allow the tighter margins around the tissue. We want to be able to reproduce every time we put a patient on the table. This can lead to higher dose to tumor, so which means we, we can prescribe more dose into whatever we want to prescribe, what we are treating, whether it's a tumor or not. Potential for better tumor control, potential for fewer complications, tracking of tumor during patient motion due to breathing. So as we immobilize the patient, we have to think about all this. We have to think what are the complications if I don't immobilize the patient very well. So I got some examples over here and I got a couple examples from you guys that I will be displaying. So for those who are in the audience, how many of, if you can write in the chatter, how many of you do you do this kind of uh, markings with tattoos? This is mostly everyone, but I would like to see, do we have any comments on the chat? Chat, okay. Well, it's mostly hellos. <clears throat> let's see, let's give people a, a minute yeah. Can you can you write in the chat if you use these these markers for your skin markers? How do you set up your patients? Are you using uh, a tattoo system like over here on the on the picture where the patients get a tattoo? Now these tattoos are permanent, so that's a really good way to have a very reproducible way to mark the patient, and then you use the the pencil marker to be able to, to guide you with your lasers. So in this picture, he said we mark with markers when we use the two, using markers from the laser, but not the two. All right. So, which is very common in most practice. So when, when we use markers, uh, we have to make sure that also, as you see in this picture below here, your immobilization device is indexed. So we'll see more pictures later. And these markers are important when you are positioning the patient because for systems that use laser, uh, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. So for patients that are laying on the tables, the markers using the laser systems are really a good way to put the two more close to position to the isocenter. Now, in most centers in developing countries, they might have an accelerator and a laser system, but they might not have a, an onboard imaging. So making sure that the lasers are calibrated and the markers are permanent assures you a reproducibility in a daily base. Because if you have an imaging system, such as a KB or a, a Convin, you have a better uh, chances to have the two more close to position than not having it. So. Uh, it's a good idea always to, to do the permanent market when you don't have other aids. 
We got this example from Center de Oncology and Ochta, is how you pronounce. So if there is anybody uh, on the call from this center that would like to walk us through what they have done or you guys wanna open discussions, otherwise we can just go through the image. So is anybody who wants to talk about these images? Hey, do you guys want to talk or share your experience? Have you this up or... Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, it's Kausar from Morocco and exactly from this center. Excellent. Musa. Yeah, so it was me who sent these pictures. Unfortunately, I didn't get time to take photos for what we have actually. So normally, this is how we do with patients. Uh, the, the first photo left. This is how we do with patients with uh, breast cancer. So as you can see, uh, we use like BBs and markers and everything to make it simple to the physicists to go through the planning uh, objective and the contouring, of course, during the, co the first session of contouring with the, the medical oncologist. And the other one is a pelvic, actually, it's an old lady with a pelvic cancer, especially cervix cancer. So also we use the markers and everything just to make it easy and to position in materials to help the patient, the doctor, and the physicist to go through the treatment. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question. While I was looking this picture this morning, do you guys yeah. use wires to set up the, the boundary fields of the breast? Or the yes, breast? already done. It's the huge mark. mark. Over yeah. here. Yeah, that's yeah. for, for that's the superior yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, this is a great example of how you set up your breast on simulation. and. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sending this. It's important for the therapist to have a midline plane so you can align the patient into the center of the table. It's important to have your lateral BBs so you know the level where you're gonna raise the table. And you have to take into account as well your immobilization devices, such as the breast pore in this case. So when doing simulation, you know, you will encounter some challenges with certain patients where the bore of the simulator is not large enough, so you have to accommodate for those patients. And I'll show you some examples later on how to account for certain cases like this. Sometimes one of the challenges in the clinic is for patients with big belly. Sometimes the, the BBs or the, or the tattoos, they will move around because of just the position of the belly. So it's a good idea sometimes to use a belly belt or a Beltro belt to position the belly into the same position. So that way, especially if you are shooting anterior beams and the belly flop goes up and down, uh, you might change the entrance dose of the beam, which will change the dose distribution on your target. So when, when you encounter patients with large stomach areas or bellies, uh, it's good to have a better reproducible position and device on maybe just, you know, a little tape around to secure the same position. It's a challenge for sure. It is difficult and that, that comes in center to center and the way that every physician feels comfortable treating. So this is a great way to immobilize breasts or to set up breasts. There's not much, sometimes in breasts, people use breast caps when people have large breasts and when large breasts, very similar effect as the belly, you don't know where the breast is going to be. Sometimes, depending on the role of the patient, the breast might lay in a little bit more anterior. And if the breasts are large, uh, it's hard to reproduce the same position of the breast. So some people use breast caps in order to secure the breast position. So position is an immobilization device for head. There is several options out there for head, uh, whether you're treating head and neck, only head, cranial. In this case, uh, you can see over here, there's multiple vendors that you can choose in the market. There is an advantage in using an extended seven points head and neck frame like here, because some patients are not compliant and they tend to move their shoulders. And if you do not lock or tie up the head and neck immobilization device, you might encounter some rotation. Again, this is not 
dramatic if you are doing a palliative for a palliative treatment for the brain. But if you are treating a sinus cavity or tone, uh, those small rotations may affect and your dose distributions as you want sharper penumbras in certain areas. So we got these examples from the Daman Oncology Center. Uh, is anybody on the center who would like to talk a little bit about these two cases? Hi guys. Do you want to talk about these cases or the question? How did it come on? Okay, hi. The first case. Uh, Harry, can you increase your voice? Can I stop it for you? Okay. Uh, the first case on the left is a pelvis case for rectal cancer. Mm -hmm. The patient was lying uh, prone on the belly port and he was fixated using a belt shell, a four point belt shell. And as you can see, the markers in the central and the user origin was denoted uh, on the, the shelf. So it can be easier aligned in the, with the laser of the treatment unit, as well as the case for the head and neck, which is always a, 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 a also a palliative case for whole brain. Excellent. This is an excellent picture, a great example of immobilization device in a, in a belly bore with prone position. So when doing these kinds of immobilization device, in my experience in the clinic, it was advised that the patient wear as minimum clothing as possible because their clothing might vary from day to day. And it's something that we cannot account whether they come with jeans or shorts or, you know, uh, thicker pants. And but in this case, we are treating a rectum. Most likely the field is very large. So the uncertainty is taken into account in your expansion from uh, GTV to PTV. But absolutely, thank you for sending so this. Actually, that was a question for me? Okay. Uh, this patient this is not an actual patient. It's a volunteer. So okay. it's, it's a little bit difficult to enforce a minimalistic clause. <laughs> no. Yeah, understood. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, good, good job in this setup. I think uh, this is a fantastic setup. When treating these kind of scenarios, you know, you, you, you have to, before doing these treatments and setting the patient in the, in the belly board, I'm sure in order to achieve some coverage, you will have to shoot some posterior beams that will go through the belly board. So it is advisable as a physicist always to estimate the transmission and the attenuation of the belly boards and, and, and also determine the position of where your couch rails are on and how much is going to attenuate and make sure that during your QA, you can achieve those numbers and, and understand the, the dosimetric effect of the couch, the belly board and any other attenuator on the path of the beam. Uh, do you wanna talk about do you want to talk about the second case? Okay, while we're waiting for him to answer, the student said that he didn't send any photos because they don't, they don't have um, a CT simulator. So do you, do you use the similar immobilization devices with the conventional, that's for me, I'm curious, for conventional SIM or what do you do? Sorry, I didn't catch the question very well. <clears throat> so it sounds like the student doesn't have CT sim. So I'm assuming they have a conventional simulator. Are the since we're talking about immobilization devices, do you use similar ones for conventional? If you have a conventional sim, or oh, the student says yes, we use them. Okay. Okay, so they do. Excellent. Yes. Right. Well. On simulating head and neck uh, positioning devices such as this one, uh, there's some research out there that shows that having the open mask, it produces less anxiety into the patient. Uh, there are some patients that are claustrophobic or they just don't like to be enclosed completely. So uh, there are several other options where you can open the mask and have a pretty much a full mask open all the way to your mouth and eyes. It is important always to, if you're going to do hyperfractionation surgeries, this is more important because the chin, if the chin is not secure properly, 
that will allow you to have a rotation in the head. And when you're treating a small target such as trigeminal neuralgia, that's a, a very important factor. Or if you just wanna, if you're treating a certain lesions on the brain and you wanna avoid the uh, optical nerves, you don't wanna have rotation. So there, there are some solutions out there where they reinforce the chin in order to minimize that effect. When treating head and neck, it's important to immobilize the neck. And there are some other devices that I will show you later that it will allow you to lock the shoulders and give a little bit more of comfort to the patient. But these two examples were great. I really appreciate you guys sending the examples and, and showing us your procedures. I think what you are doing is exactly what we've been doing here in the United States and other countries. So good job on that. So we talk about different additional devices that we can use. You know, you have the prone pillow, you have the breast, the breast boards, and as well the alpha cradles that you can uh, use to immobilize the patients. Bear in mind when using all these immobilization devices, make sure that the physicists they understand the dosimetric consequences of each one of these devices. We don't want to change the dosimetric effect into the tumor control. So one of the key importance in, in our process is the registration devices. How do you register your device? So we have an example over here. If you have access to this report from AAPM, is uh, the tax group 66, quality assurance for computer tomography. It gives you some steps on how to do the quality control for your simulators and your CT scanners. So this is what we want. Whatever we do in the simulation process, we want to have it repeatable. We want to do it exactly as it is on the treatment day. So if you're putting an immobilization device, a breastboard, a wedge, a compensator, a sponge, you know, one of those thermoplastic masks, they have to be indexed in the same position as they will be indexed in the treatment room. Now there is a wiggle on, on numbers so in the anterior, in the in and out position of the table where people can have some room, but it's advisable to have index position, which is very repeatable. For example, over here, this, this board in, in a variant couch, this one has an index immobilization device or an index bar with two little rods coming out. So these rods come handy in order to immobilize the, the alpha cradle or your, or your immobilization back. And you can see that on the CT simulator, so you know where it is, and so you have a better idea of your position. Why is this important? I have a, a little chart that I presented before. Over here is the residual error against the correction for immobilization devices versus uh, non-immobilization devices. So for example, if we use a skin mark only, like we saw in the pictures, if we only use the tattoos or the pencil, uh, the permanent markers on the skin, the residual errors when we set up a patient goes around six millimeter. If we do weekly pelvis with an anterior posterior or ortho, ortho pair imaging system, whether it's KV or MV, your immobilization error reduces at four millimeter. If you do daily pelvis, ortho pair, your immobilization error reduces by probably a half millimeter. If you do ultrasound, it's very similar to do a weekly. Doing a daily ultrasound has a larger error than, uh, than the ortho pair. And then you have the daily radiograph with fiducials, fiducials that are inserted by the physicians in certain parts of the, of the body and you can register to the fiducials and you can see your immobilization error, your residual error went down to almost two millimeter. Now, if you do daily CVCT, it reduces to two millimeter. And if you do daily CVCT with fiducials, it goes all the way to 1.5 millimeter. So, 
it makes a difference uh, to see what you're treating and to be able to, to reproduce your setup correctly or in, in a more uh, consistent manner. So I know that many centers, they, they don't have the budget to, to include all these technologies. So if you're going to do a skin marks, try to be as reproducible as possible and as well, make sure that your lasers are calibrated properly. It's, so, uh, John Michael, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, what do RL, AP, and SI stand for? R right, left, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. Okay. And then actually another point with the skin markers, I heard in Sudan that one of the challenges is that the temperature is so hot <clears throat> that sometimes the markings streak or they rub off. Yes. And that's why it's recommended to do a tattoo. So mm -hmm. with the tattoo dot that I show in this picture over here, so the tattoo is permanent. So you have to tell the patient that they are gonna have a dot. Mm -hmm. Most therapists, they tattoo their hand with couple dots so they can show the patient on simulation. And, and that's a permanent tattoo that they will have it forever. Do you know if it's, if it's easy or expensive to, to do a tattoo? It's fairly cheap. It's very cheap. I mean, a whole ink for a year might cost you 20 bucks. So, and, and then the last thing for centers that haven't used tattoos before, does it, does it hurt the patient? Do, do patients complain about it? I uh, use a little ink, but I mean, it's a trade-off, right? The therapists that I work with, with the patients that they were not compliant, they told them, it was like, hey, listen, whether you get a tattoo or we don't treat you. <laughs> and, but most people in my experience, they were okay because, I mean, they understand going through radiation therapy is not one of the easiest thing. And they told them that probably the tattoo will be the most painful part they're gonna feel in the whole therapy. And, and it's just like a poke, so. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> yeah. So what people do also, if they use markers, they, they give the patient uh, a marker that to take home. So after they take shower, they can remark it and make sure that the markers stays and they don't fade off. So that will be another alternative just to, but it will, it will depend a lot on how consistent is the patient or the family of the patient to try to keep the marks alive. So, so this is a whole workflow uh, that I got it from Gupta et al. That they, that they compiled this one a long time ago. So I think this is very generic, but I, I like to go through it. It gives us ideas of what we are doing. We have the diagnostic done by the physician, then the physician ordered the planning of the CT or the simulator. And then in between, depending of, you know, what you're doing and how much resources you have, you might order an MRI, PET CT and fuse those data, delineated volume, create a dose, and then go through the treatment delivery and then the review. So accuracy is more, it's very important when we are doing this. So we have to make sure that the imaging isocenter of the LINAC, the mechanical isocenter of the LINAC and the radiation isocenter of the LINAC, they, are, they all are within one to two millimeters. Uh, I understand that for some machines, this is uh, not achievable. Two millimeters should be achievable for most machines doing radiotherapy these days. So <clears throat> I think several other topics in these lectures in, in the whole sessions are covering this. Go ahead. Sorry, before we move forward, the student was wondering if you recommend specific marker pens or can any permanent marker, all-purpose acetone-based marker? Any permanent yes. marking should do it. Thank you. Yeah, especially those that you use for shipping. Those are really good. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that's what we used to use in the clinic because they don't rub up so easily. Like, are, are they not thick though, the ones they use for shipping? Or do they have them like with thin head? Not really. I mean, it's, 
there is no FDA regulations for markers or any regulation. So, yeah, true, uh, true. Yeah, as as long as as long as it's, it's useful, I think it should be fine. Right, but for the for the dot in the middle, you need it to be thin enough, right? Like you don't want it to be more than uh, I don't know, a millimeter, uh, two millimeters, I'd say. Uh, no, it's just a simple dot. It's, it will yeah. be like it will be like a freckle. Yeah. So, I mean, you have the dots so the therapists, they can know where the mark is and then they will use the markers to, to, to highlight the, the lines to be able to align it with the CT scan, with the laser system. Makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm gonna skip this one, this one. So simulation process and simulation, as we saw before in the previous slides, it can be, a, a tedious process, labor intensive. It, depending of the complexity of the simulation, you might need some physicists to, to guide the therapies and tell you, okay, this is what we need to do because if we simulate it this way, we will not have beam coverage or some beams or the will will have collisions with the machine. So it's important to, to pay attention and be patient, especially for for organs where like the lung, liver, adrenal, pancreas, and pelvis, which they move a lot. So you want to have a better immobilization device. So we talk about alpha cradles. Alpha cradles helps immobilization, immobilizing patient, and you can reuse it. Body fix are really good immobilization devices with the air pump. These are the ones that you can reuse. The alpha cradles, you cannot once the patient uses it, then he can take it home for souvenir or throw it to the trash. So you will see in the clinic that not, not all patients are easy to set up or simulate. There are patients that are very complex. I put this picture over here in a previous lecture, just to show you how complex can be to treat a patient. Immobilization devices are very expensive and as long as uh, it's being shown that you can create your immobilization device. As long as you understand the dosimetric effect and you are able to measure how much the transmission attenuation and the dosimetric effect into the target will create, it is fine. I mean, it is fine to do your own custom uh, immobilization device. But again, this comes with a little bit of experience. This comes with understanding your system your couch transmission, having a CT scanner where you can evaluate the electron density of each one of these and understanding the equivalent uh, path of the beam and doing a dosimetric analysis of the, your, your dose coverage, it can be done. So, but again, this might be labor intensive. You might need a little bit more extra hands of physicists helping you with with hours outside of the clinical practice. So make sure as we talk about the, the markers, marking the patient is not the only market we need to take into account. Marking the immobilization device is important as well. So that will help us to reproduce the positioning into the table. So many people, they say, oh yeah, we mark the patient, we have the two, but then they don't know where the immobilization device goes. And that's one of the problems uh, documented well during simulations because you might simulate a patient with a uh, with certain couch top with certain immobilization device and then you don't have instructions for the therapies and then they put the patient based on the marks on the skin and then they realize after treatment that the patient needed a different table or another immobilization device so that will cause little problems because that will totally change the attenuation of the beam and the dose coverage. So that is very important. There are some simulation challenges. You know, the bore of the CT scan is not as large as we would like. You see this patient over here, not the horse, the horse is just for, for example of what can be done. But this patient over here is, is, uh, is a large patient, very tall, very wide and his elbows, they don't feed properly into the CT scan board. So how do you do that for a patient that 
you need to feed it on the CT scan. So this patient is holding a ring mm. and the ring makes his elbows wider. So if you take the ring away and you ask the patient to hold hands, now there will be room for his elbows to get into the CT simulator. That works fine if the patient is compliant, but what about with patients that they cannot move their, 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 their shoulders? Several cancer patients, they are weak as it is. So it is really hard to, to position it. So there are methods that you can use. Some patients, they are, uh, you have to tape their hands into the immobilization device. And this reproduction, reproducibility in the clinic is one of the most challenges. But it comes with patient. So remember, the, the, the patients are as much afraid as you are to treat them. So patient and, you know, compassion as well. Sometimes we forgot about that part in our lives. Any questions for me? All right. So let's continue. So when immobilizing abdomen, there are, if you want to minimize the motion into, for the lung, there are some abdomen compression systems. And when you start putting immobilization devices such as this, then you encounter with the problem of how do I mark the skin? You know, and will I be able to see the mark? Will I be able to see the, the tattoo that I am placing on? Are these immobilization devices on my way? So when doing that, sometimes you have to do shifts and you have to shift the patient a certain amount to be able to mark it in a place where you can set up the patient and then known uh, a fixed number of the table shift to move uh, into that position. So you, you can account for, 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 for these devices and, and all the, the inconvenience that comes with it. So, Make sure that when you tattoo, you always have more than three reference points to tattoo. So you can coordinate, you can find a coordinate system for, for your target isocenter. So how comfortable it is, you have to have a trade-off of how much do you want to immobilize and how much is the patient being able to stand it. You might be uh, experiencing breaking some ribs in, in elder patients or putting too much pressure that Sometimes the patients are so nervous during simulation that they will accept anything just to get it over with. So you simulate it, you put a compression device, you put a, a, a tattoo on them and they are laying on the table, it's fine. So they come to the treatment room, it's the first day of treatment and they cannot lay flat because their back hurts. Uh, because the compression device that you place on them, they don't feel comfortable anymore. They are bloated and they are annoyed. They are frustrated. So <clears throat> take into consideration all that when, when you go cowboy on the clinic and try to immobilize as much as you can. Make sure and do an assessment of uh, how well your patient is doing. Very important. Uh, document everything you do in simulation, so it will be reproducible during treatment. Scan borders, where do you want to scan? You don't want to scan the whole patient. If you are treating head and neck, you know, it's good to, to leave five to 10 CMs above the head to account for a scatter. And it's good to leave another 10, five to 10 CM below the, the inferior part of the target for scatter calculations. So make sure that you give clear orders to, to your therapist or to whoever is scanning. Initial reference, make sure that uh, you document whether this is supine, prone, what kind of immobilization devices are using. So documentation is very important when it comes to a workflow. So, so that way it is reproducible. Initial setup, it always helps, you see, I think you guys are aware of the BB systems. Putting BBs, it helps a lot to finding your reference setup on the treatment planning system. Uh, some people like to contour that one and find the center, that was the old method. Now most treatment planning systems, 
if you align your coordinate systems with the with the little BB, let me see over here, you can see the BB, the ball bearings, little metal pellets that you can place into the patients, into the mask. So that helps you to set up your isocenter or your reference system. And I think in this uh, picture that uh, I found in this textbook, they have the same, they have little BBs. So that helps to, to reference. The BBs won't be there when the patients are treated. Instead of the BBs, you will expect to have tattoos. And there will be a shift in between tattoos and BBs that are just sagging of the patient rotation. So uh, that's why it's important to set up reference. So that way you give to the treatment planning system a reference system to register to the patient. So it's important to understand the resolution of your reconstruction in, in the imaging system. The chunkier, thicker, the slice thickness, the course of the presentation. You can see over here a zero millimeter reconstruction versus a three millimeter reconstruction. And you see the amount of information that you gain by, by having less millimeters in your reconstruction. But again, you have to think about, you have enough storage to account for multiple images that you are saving and, arch and archiving. So in the simulation process, you have concept as the BEV, Vince Eye View, which is the view from the source viewpoint. You have the DRR, the Digital Reconstructed Radiograph, a computer-generated 2D planar X-ray. And then you have a DCR, a Digitally Composed Radiograph, which blends one, more than one DRR at a different window levels. So you can see over here these examples. All these images, they come handy when you do image registration on the moment of treatment. Uh, it is important when you are doing, before doing the delivery treatment and all this previous process that we talked to understand the dosimetric effect of your immobilization devices. So whether you're gonna use a couch, you're gonna use, you know, cushions or other immobilization devices, it is advisable for you to understand the dosimetric effect, to put a phantom over there to measure a QA. And then this is important for those centers that are trying to do motion monitoring. There is a huge amount of motion in, especially over here in, in the lower part of the, of the lung. There is motion all over our bodies, uh, even the prostate is moving. But if you see, if you take a CT scan of this region of the body without taking any consideration into the motion, you will see this artifact. And this artifact is due to motion. The lower, the lower di diagram, huh, diagram, diaphragm, he has low, larger motion. And you can see from a sphere, your image of reconstruction will be totally different. So there are different ways to do motion control. And I put this picture just to go briefly about it. So you can put a little reflective BB on top of the patient with a infrared camera. The camera is going to see how much the BB is moving based on your motion. Some patients are larger, some patients are shallow. And then the CT scanner will take slices continuously and then you can register those slices based on the motion and see where they belong. So with this technique, you can do 4D scanning and you can do maximum intensity projection and minimum intensity projection, which over here, you can see a maximum intensity projection with a minimum intensity projection. You can average both of those and, and find an average images. So that way you can estimate your concept of the ITV, your intended treated volume that you will be treated, but uh, probably we'll cover this in a different lecture with more intensive material. The motion is relative to where you have the tumor. And there is this report in TG6070, uh, Six, it shows you the different magnitude of motions depending where the tumor is. And these magnitudes can go all the way to nice centimeters to uh, 12 centimeters. 
is very large motion. So I thought about uh, covering treatment verification methods, but I think uh, I'm gonna stop over here and we'll have to continue this, this part of the session. So I'm gonna open the, the, the session now for questions, discussions and comments for everyone, please feel free. Uh, this is your time. Uh, okay, the floor is yours guys. Any questions or okay. comments? Uh, if I may, I have some questions about the accounting for immobilization in the, in the calculation. Sorry, can you speak a little bit higher? I do not hear you. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I have some questions about uh, accounting for mobilization kits in the calculation. Excuse well, me. Uh, Taking into, take into account the mobilization kits. Yes. Okay. You know, immobilization, it depends. Excuse uh, me. Excuse me. There's a mistake. All right. So. I think okay. your question is how do I account for for immobilization devices? Well, uh, that's, that's a rather easy exercise. You can put an ion chamber in between your immobilization device, your couch, and the beam path. So you can see the attenuation. You can put the chambers without the immobilization device, taking a measurement, and then take it with the immobilization device. And then you can do a ratio and then you will have a number that will estimate the attenuation. So when doing um, that, if the attenuation is minimum, you know, you have to account how many beams are going, <coughs> what kind of technique are you using? Is this going to average out? And then you can always use your QA device to do it. But as long as you have an ion chamber measurement and you can account for that, uh, that will give you an idea of how much transmission attenuation is happening. Just like, um, when you, just like when you commission your couch. Okay, but I was thinking, if I can scan the mobilization kits uh, and then contour it or save it in the directory, in the materials for uh, fixation, then I can add it to the patient. Doesn't that account for the material and the attenuation it can occur? Yes, if you are comfortable there, your treatment planning system is, is taking into account for that, if you, which is common practice. Most centers, they account their immobilization device as part of the patient contour. Okay. Is it more important to do so for 3D conformal or for IMT? In other words, does a variation in delivered goals in not accounting uh, for the set up for the immobilization greater than, let's say, 1 or 2 percent? or it should be calculated in the center. So your question is, where is this more important for 3D or IMRT? And how much is the percentage of acceptability of this attenuation? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is. Well, bear in mind that IMRT will deliver more MUs faster than 3D. So you have more chances to, to miss it. So it's more important for IMRT than 3D. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, if I may have uh, another question about the reconstruction resolution. It's obvious that if I use a thinner slices in the CT simulator, I can get a better resolution uh, mm -hmm. in the reconstructed image. But can't I use, let's say, uh, a 2.5 millimeter slide for the CT simulator? Then I can reconstruct uh, the images in the TBS in between. I can interpolate the images. Thus, I can have a higher resolution in the reconstruction. Yes, it is better to reconstruct. Let's say you, you take your, let me explain this. It is better to take finer slices and then do a thicker reconstruction than do a thicker slices and do a finer reconstruction. Because when you do finer reconstructions with thicker slices, you are extrapolating just mathematical numbers. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, this is important when you are doing a small targets. If you are doing large targets and you're reconstructing, let's say a prostate that you scan it with uh, 1.5 millimeter. I mean, you will make a difference in the number of slides you're seeing, but if you are trying to contour uh, a parotid gland, you might want to do finer 
uh, slices on your scanning, not on your reconstruction. So that way you have more true scanning, scan slides to do your contours. Does it make sense? Yeah, yes, actually. Uh, okay, my final question, if I may. In the set of markers, the conventional marking of can I use additional markers for accounting for the rotation and tilting of the patient? So if your question is, if we have markets to account for rotation? My question is, I use uh, the markings in the patient to set up the patient, uh, the patient with the treatment laser. Can I use an additional markings in the patient to account for any uh, tilting or rotation that the patient may Honestly, it's hard to account for rotation with markers. Uh, in order to do rotation, you will have to have a 6D couch. Even the 3D couch doesn't correct for rotation. Now, rotation of the patient is one thing that you can probably resolve by aligning with the central laser in the mid plane and then moving the patient's skin. But then that rotation will be the skin rotation. You don't know what inside in the, in, in the tumor is happening. The only way to correct for rotation inside, inside the patient is using a six degree couch. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. Great. And Saif, our, our colleagues at uh, Yemen, did you have a question as well? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when uh, we use reconstruction for image density, sometimes the image will become more than 200 image. It's well take planning system. Uh, if we reduce the, the re reconstruction, it's better to reduce it. Sorry, can someone paraphrase the question for me? I had a hard time. Sarah, maybe I you can ask the question in Arabic. I think yeah, that's great. I'm going to reconstruction in the simulator. The planning system, the database of the planning system. So he's basically saying after reconstruction, you end up with so many images in your treatment planning system, which uh, takes a lot of the space from uh, the memory from the computer, from the treatment planning system. How can you accommodate that? I guess I'll deal with that. But I didn't think the reconstructing the images increases. Like, I didn't think that would be an issue of the reconstruction itself, right, John? I'm trying to uh, process the oh, question. Sorry. <laughs> I was just sure. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not following, honestly, the question right now. Tia, do so, you follow the question? No, not quite. So I told them I didn't think that reconstructing the reconstruction policy increases the images or adds any images, really. So maybe the better question would be, if you end up with so many images in your system, yeah. how, you, how can you deal with well, it? Like you, are, you archive old patients and things like that. Yeah. Like what, most, what most centers they do, let me show my, my screen. Let's see, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Uh, let's see, you have a cube with, oh, shit. how do I do a, a cube here, shit? I don't know if I can show, I'll just talk it out. So if you have, let's say, a, C, a scan thickness of two millimeters, right? And you're scanning a, a head and neck, and then you have the scanning and then some people, they decided to reconstruct to one millimeter. And by reconstructing, you are interpolating to a slide thickness. And that will create multiple slices and will generate larger data on your computer. But in my opinion, reconstructing that way, it's not proper for certain parts of radiotherapy because what, when you are doing extrapolation in between two slices, uh, you don't know if where your contour is going to lay is really where it's supposed to. But if you do one millimeter thickness in your CT scan, uh, you can have more slices to contour better. But yes, 
your computer is going to fill up with more images and you're going to lose space. So that's why it's important to create in the clinic protocols to what targets do they need finer slices and what not. So for example, if you are treating a large pelvis, you don't need one millimeter slice thickness. You can go by with two millimeters or three millimeters, depending on the treatment modality. But if you are treating you know, a sinal cavity or you're treating a little neuroma in the brain, you do need the finer slices. So it all depends you know, how your protocol and what protocol you're following. And also, you know, how much data do you want to storage in your computer? Does it make sense? Yes, but I didn't even realize there's such a thing. So in the tumor planning system, you could have thick slices, like 2.5, and then you start to interpolate and give you thinner slices. And is that like an option in all tumor planning systems? Yeah, look, let me show you uh, something over here. I'll, I'll, I'll bring my remote computer somehow. Sorry, the computer just not cooperating. Here, all right. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, so this is the slight thickness that we talk about on, on a clinical base. So for example, if I want to contour this particular target over here, how many slices do I need until this target disappears? So, see, this particular target is being uh, done at one millimeter. So the more slices I have, the more slices I can contour and have a better accurate drawing. But if the, if the slice thickness is two or three millimeter, then I go a slice by a slice and then I have less, less contours. So depending of how busy is the center and if you have residents or not, and if they have time to do the contouring, uh, it makes a difference. Now, if you're treating a pelvis and it's not small like that, larger slight thickness should be appropriate. So that concept makes sense. The part that I do not understand is how does um, reconstruction come into play? Well, for example, over here, Let's uh, expand this so we can have a better idea. So in this target, let's say I scan at two millimeter. So this is my first slide and this is my second slide, right? Two millimeter. So then I reconstruct it and I tell the reconstruction, do one millimeter. The reconstruction, the reconstruction will go to these two slides and we'll use the information of these slides plus the information of the second slice and generate a slide in the middle. Yes. And, that, and that slide, it will be a mathematical uh, interpolation between the first one and the second one. So Interesting. Okay. In, in the case that let's say your tumor change like here, see how the, the shape change? Now the mathematical reconstruction will interpolate, which Honestly, it's not a big problem because at the end of the day, most clinical practice, they do an expansion on the PTV to GTV or the GTV to PTV. So, but if you're treating a small targets like a trigeminal neuralgia, uh, a, a small gliomas, a spine, all those numbers make difference. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, TA just posted what you said earlier and what I'm used to also is that we simply just have different protocols at the CT simulator and the slice thickness is determined by these protocols. So it depends on whether we're scanning brain or pelvis. So for example, uh, but Stuart has a question that has not to do with it. He says he's heard that green or he was told that green lasers are better than red lasers again. Is that true? Localizing lasers. Sorry, I, I did not catch the, the question. The question had to do with the lasers. He said, does the, does the color of the laser, laser matter? He said he has heard repeatedly. Oh, the color of the laser. Yeah. Well, 
there's been some study showing that different skin colors reflect better in different laser colors. Like in Detroit, where I trained, it was a trend to change to green color because darker people like me, you know, it, the skin can uh, reflect better with green and blue colors. Lighter people, it's okay to use the red color. Now, you have to understand that if you use uh, green and blue color, the prices between those two, uh, we're talking about $5,000. If you're, if you're talking about the red color, which is, which is fine, mostly is, uh, you know, it comes within your budget. So you have to justify to your manager what you need a, a green laser or a blue laser and what advantage is going to bring into into your clinical practice? Is it going to make a difference setting up the patient? I personally believe not, but some people here in the United States, they have the money to do it, so why not? Well, perhaps if the majority of the nation, uh, of the population in the nation are dark-skinned. It, yes, it, ma it, makes a, it makes a difference for the therapists in the room. It is easy. Over here in the United States, some therapists, they have to use a little flashlight to, to look into where the fiducia is and where the lasers are marking. So it, it makes easy if your population is larger, yes. I mean, and if you can convince an administration that that's the way you want to go, why not? It doesn't hurt. Okay. okay. All right. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much for having patience with me and listening me out. Well, this was a great session. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. And please, if, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I don't think if I put my email over here, but... Actually, yeah. Benjamin did earlier, I think, right? Yeah, let, let me uh, write my email over here. Sure. Thank you. All right. So everyone, John is uh, typing his email address. This is really nice of him. So if you guys have questions, feel free to email him. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tia, for the template. Nice job. And thank you, everyone, for, for attending and, you know, for doing the good work, the good work you guys are doing. Uh, and so until next time. Thank All you right. so much, Jan. Uh, my pleasure. See, it's time for me to put my daughter to bed. <laughs> <laughs> good. Have a good day. Thank Thanks, you so guys. much, everyone. Great to see you. Bye. Thank you.